welcome to this How To Academy event with me, Matt Stadlin, regular presenter here at How To Academy, and a former Telegraph columnist, BBC presenter, and LBC presenter. I'm really pleased to introduce to you someone I'm sure many of you will already know from her Instagram account, possibly Twitter as well, maybe even first-hand experience, Emmy Brunner. She's a psychotherapist herself. She set up the Recover Clinic, and she's just written this book, which you can all get at the end of the session if you haven't already, Find Your True Voice. I'm not going to waste any time in introducing you further, Emmy, because there's so much to get through. But would you start by just telling us, as you explain early in the book yourself, why you, why you wrote it? Yeah, um, I wrote the book because I think so much of my career has been working and doing really powerful work, but with a fairly small group of people. And I think the book was an opportunity to give people far and wide the opportunity to work through some of the strategies that have evolved over my kind of clinical career and help people find a different way of nurturing themselves, essentially and having a, a kind of more joyful existence. You were saying in, in the green room that in Britain, and you've got experience of America as well, but in Britain, we can find it quite difficult to accept vulnerability. And yet one of the things that you do and you write about is to say that you yourself have been vulnerable in the past and perhaps in an ongoing way. Yeah, I think it. I think it's such a cultural thing here for us to be to find it really difficult to be vulnerable. And there's a lot of shame attached to being vulnerable. And I think particularly when with regards to our mental health, um, really having a narrative, knowing how to talk about that and express what might be going on for us. I think so many of us don't really attend to that part of ourselves unless we're in a real crisis. Um, and I think for me as a clinician and just as a, just as a person having these conversations, it was always really important for me to show up and be vulnerable and kind of try and model that for the people that I work with, what that could look like for them. So as I said, the main title to your book is Find Your True Voice. Mm -hmm. But part of finding your true voice is saying no to other things. And the subtitle of the book is Stop Listening to Your Inner Critic, Heal Your Trauma, and Live a Life Full of Joy. I love that last bit. Can we just pick up on that trauma bit? Because you say that lots and lots of people, even whether they might be suffering from body dysmorphia or eating issues generally or they might have low self-esteem or they might suffer from intense anxiety they might be an addict trauma in your experience seems to be at the root of a lot of this yeah absolutely i mean all of us have experienced trauma that's the nature of being human beings we all encounter distressing stressful or um emotionally up setting events throughout life um, and the key thing is really what tools we have then to process those events and those experiences and for some of us who perhaps and myself definitely included in this I didn't have the strategies to be able to process those events successfully and so I developed other tools that perhaps weren't so nurturing that became more destructive and so in my experience and long experience of working with people with eating disorders, as you say, um, was that an eating disorder really was a, a strategy for trying to cope and trying to manage. And the kind of common thread that I found with all of the people that I worked with over the years was the presence of this persistent critical narrative that they had in their heads. Um, and that seemed to be the core of the problem. You know, what was the story that they were living by the story that they were telling themselves about who they were? And that was the kind of crux of the issue. What's the difference between the sort of trauma that you're talking about and the sort of trauma that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder? Post-traumatic stress disorder is really when an event occurs where you feel that your life or the life of somebody else is in, is in jeopardy, in danger. Um, and, and then you have an immediate response to that event. And we go into kind of fight, flight or freeze um, following those events. And generally, those events, it can be a little bit easier actually to identify the response that you've had because you can remember what you were like before the event occurs and you know that the impact it's had on you following. And sometimes with more um, kind of covert traumas, it's harder to really even identify a trauma. Lots of people don't even think they have trauma. Um, 
and then to recognize what your responses might have been to that, particularly if those traumas have occurred in early years, because so many of us don't have a pre-trauma personality that we can remember or kind of identify even. So how hard can it be then to dig out that trauma? And is there a risk of trying to create trauma or find trauma when perhaps there isn't one? Yes, yeah, it's, it's not really a question of kind of digging around in painful material. It's more of a, a, a kind of gentler acceptance that being a human being means that we encounter difficult events and painful experiences. And most people won't have to think very hard to be able to reference those things. The key question really is how do we cope with these events when they do happen, not whether they've happened. Um, and what are our strategies? How do we manage things when life gets difficult? How big a part of how we are today do you think, in your view, our childhood was or early formative experiences? I think it's absolutely massive. I think it's so significant because I think what happens during those early years is that we're, we're given, literally given, uh, stories about how the world is, what to expect, how to prepare ourselves and some of those things can be really helpful and some of those things can be detrimental to us we're inheriting views of other people's things ideas even that maybe don't belong to us you know so many things we don't even think about you know why we vote the way we do you know is that because that's something that we investigated and discovered and came to a conclusion with, with or is it something that we inherited an ideology that didn't even really belong to us so people don't necessarily take the moments to ask these questions. And when we do, it calls into question a, a lot of our choices, I think. It's a wonderful story or anecdote. It's a story, really, that you tell quite early on. And that's about someone who, who falls down a hole and is trapped in a hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just tell, t tell us that, because I thought it was very poignant. So, yeah, it's something I share quite a lot in treatment. And I think it's um, basically a person's walking down the street and they fall into a hole and they're stuck and they can't get out and they're screaming for help. And a doctor walks past and throws down a prescription and they're like, great, but I'm still stuck here. And then a holy person walks past and offers to say a prayer. And they're like, that's great. Thanks. But I'm still stuck here. And then a friend walks down and jumps in the hole and they're like, what are you doing here? Why have you jumped in the hole? And they say, because I've been down here before and I know how to get out. And I think for me, that that sort of little anecdote just encapsulates what it is to be human and shared experience, the value of shared experience. Um, and the comfort of knowing that you're not alone because somebody else can empathise with how you feel in a moment. Because I think when we have these issues, they silence us and shame silences us and it makes us feel separate from everyone else and as soon as you start having a more open conversation and you start risking being brave and showing up that's when connections made and I think that's when the magic happens you know and you realize you're not alone actually. It's a very powerful story because core to its message seems to me that there is someone out there for all of us who wants to help us. Yeah uh, yeah absolutely I think so and I think as well when we're really in that lonely place it's something about having abandoned ourselves at some point having abandoned what was important to us or our voice or our morals even something where we've dis disconnected from whatever our truth is and I think part of showing up for yourself and having the confidence eventually to find a voice is quite empowering it's quite a brave thing to do. Your story actually reminds me of the, the rock climber who, who lost his footing and slipped and was clinging on to the rock face with his fingernails, desperately hoping that there was going to be a deus ex machina to save him. So he, he looked up and he says, is there anyone out there? This big voice booms down and it's God and God says, just let go of the cliff and this cloud will bear you gently down to the, to the basin, to the floor, to the valley floor. And the man thinks about it for, for a little while and then looks back up and says, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> but the point is there are people there, such as yourself. I mean, you're, you, you spent your life, your adult life, helping people. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense of how many people get through these difficulties without much effort 
And how many, how, what sort of percentage of people does it take a, a much more enduring process? Give, give, us a, give us a sense. Clearly, people have very different struggles. Do you know what? I think the biggest barrier that people have is a belief that things can be different. People have this amazing way of feeling like they are nobody and they are nothing, and yet they are totally unique and special to everybody else, and that the rules won't apply to them somehow. It's quite amazing and I, I certainly felt like that I didn't I couldn't imagine that life could be different or that I could feel differently um, or just live a different existence and I think that's the biggest block for so many people and some people will take that leap of faith way earlier and will recognize that the life that they're living is an expression of the story that they tell themselves about who they are and when you get that, it can be pretty scary, but it's quite empowering, actually. Things, things shift quite quickly. And some people are really resistant to that and find it difficult. And I think that is the biggest difference in how long things take for people, how quickly you can surrender and let go, actually, um, and go with it. And then when you do, things just flow and it's quite amazing. Um, but for some people, they're scared and they really hold on really struggle to let go and then it does take longer I mean it's work but it's a good kind of work it's it doesn't feel like that kind of slog you know it feels like an investment in something that nurtures you and lifts you up and it's amazing actually when you can do that work so before we can find out our true voice as you describe it how do we quiet or still or stop that inner critic and what really is that inner critic flesh it out for us a bit as you do in the book I think it's kind of a, a culmination of different things I think it's the worst things you think about yourself the worst things you've ever heard about yourself your worst fears and it's kind of a summary of all those things um it generally sounds very familiar for most people the narrative is not that different which is why it's easy to identify I think the trick is not trying to placate it manage it wrestle with it get rid of it mm. That voice only really bears power when you act upon it. Mm. Um, when you begin to treat that those thoughts like any other thought that you would immediately disregard, it kind of loses all of its power. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Those thoughts really only have power when we attach meaning to them. You know, we all have crazy thoughts every day that we pay no attention to that we just immediately disregard or just think, oh, that was a bit strange that I thought that, and that's it. And yet these things, because they tap into kind of the story, we attach meaning to them. They, we think that they, they're telling us something about who we are, that they define us somehow. And when we stop doing that, when we choose to treat them as just any other thought, then they suddenly don't mean anything anymore. And that's- We have got this sort of positive voice, you say, inside us as well oh, yeah. when you ask some of the people that you you've worked with mm -hmm. what does that sound like they can't very easily a lot of them identify it mm -hmm. so you then say to them well what would a friend say and suddenly it all comes pouring out because they can identify with that yeah absolutely i think it's that it's that whisper you know that you hear that is trying to guide you and I think for, for, for a lot of people, it is just a whisper. And some people find it really hard to identify at all. It's true. But, you know, when you think of the, the words you'd offer up to a loved one or uh, someone that you care about, it's there. It's just there and it comes easily to you. And it's not hard. Think about that unwell voice and the <clears throat> repetitive nature of the unwell voice, that, that critical narrative. It's really repetitive. And uh, that other voice, that softer, quieter grace, it's just there, it's just there, um, trying to guide us. And we'll all be able to think, I think I say this in the book, actually, we're all able to think of scenarios that we went into where there was a nagging voice that sort of said, it's probably not going to work out very well. It's probably not a good idea. Um, for me, that was always like dating, going out with somebody and there'd be a voice going like, don't do that. That's not going to be, that's not going to end well. <laughs> And I'd be like, la, 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 I'm done doing it, shush, go away. And then, of course, it wouldn't end well. So it's about what happens when you start to be governed by that, that in, whatever you call that, your gut instinct, your intuition, your true voice. What if you govern your life by that? Suddenly things 
start to shift, suddenly things start to change. So is there a difference between the good, the positive voice that we already have residing in us, but perhaps we can't recognise, and the true voice? I think I wouldn't necessarily, I uh, don't know that that kind of true voice is always good. I think sometimes it can challenge us and sometimes it can call us into question to reflect on behaviours and um, but I think ultimately it's trying to put us on the right path and it's compassionate and it's nurturing and it's and it's forgiving ultimately. So I was brought up with all sorts of different conflicting messages. You know, my dad would say to me, and he was a very good dad, but he'd say things like, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that can be really helpful in certain circumstances, but if you take it too far, it can push you away from reaching out for help. And it's not how he intended it, but we can misappropriate messages. My mum, on the other hand, for example, would say to me, be kind to yourself. And I found that a really helpful thing in life. If you're mm -hmm. quite self-punishing, if you're hard on yourself, to remember that voice. And interestingly, in the book, I think you say that the positive voice can come in the shape of a, an older woman, perhaps, that we imagine it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. And I think being kind is just so overlooked just showing up in your day be kind to yourself be kind to other people and watch how your life shifts and changes you know especially if you spent a lifetime giving yourself a hard time and being unkind to yourself just takes take a moment and think about how well that's working for you you know try being showing up and being a little nicer to yourself and see what happens so much of this that was kind of people's stuff that was pathologized and people were broken often particularly coming into the clinic it seemed so simple to me that if they could learn how to be kinder to themselves then so much of what they were struggling with would fall away and it did so how do we go about starting to heal our trauma because it's kind of a it's a big claim isn't it yeah i think partly it's about thinking about what are your responses to things when they're difficult are they nurturing and compassionate or mm. are they tough and cold are you somebody who won't address things are you somebody that just pushes through you know what are those core messages as you said things that you were offered by dad and mum what are those core messages that you've had what were the strategies you were offered to cope with life um I asked somebody today actually what her self-care strategies were and she said what do you mean and I was like how do you look after yourself like actually asking ourselves that question how do I look after myself I think one of the most painful things with trauma and the the way that we ultimately heal from trauma is by validating our experiences so often when we have these painful events in our lives if they're dismissed by the people around us and this is particularly true in childhood because we're looking to people to explain or direct or support our emotional responses to things when that doesn't happen we internalize those experiences and we become the problem and sometimes it's just as simple as validating a feeling or an experience um, in order to be able to move on from it so when you talk about identifying your coping strategies and coping strategies can be negative can't they because they can reinforce the bad voice Mm -hmm. they're sort of as it were sh short-term false fixes perhaps it might be eating too much or drinking too much or yeah. pushing yourself into the wrong relationships mm -hmm. but then how do we emerge from those strategies into a healthier way of being so that we might use strategies that you would endorse i think partly the the process is you have to become conscious of what what's going on it's very difficult or impossible to change things when we're not really aware of what's happening so i think just thinking back and what are the what are the patterns that you can identify so i mentioned like dating earlier for me i'd go out with different versions of the same guy and the same thing would happen um and you think back and you think well i'm the common denominator in those situations <laughs> it's me that's showing up and actually did I know that that was going to happen? Yeah, I probably did. But there's something I'm seeking out there that's familiar. And there's comfort in the familiar, even when it's not good for us, even when it's damaging for us. And so partly it's looking back and thinking, what are those destructive patterns that I've maybe drawn into? Where do I find myself keep coming stuck? 
you know where am I keep coming up against the same things I'm struggling with because that's where the work is and then I think it's about consciously choosing to be different choosing to behave how you always did you know things only change when we stop doing what we always did and and for me that was consciously choosing to behave differently consciously choosing to speak differently to myself introducing self-care practices that were really difficult for me to do that just didn't come easily to me whether that was like a meditation practice or a journaling practice um there were very conscious decisions to learn how to be different and it it can sometimes involve quite a bit of bravery i mean if you were going out with the wrong guy to go out with the right guy might have been say to to stop going out with the wrong guy which can be a difficult thing it might be being brave enough to identify what the right sort of guy might be because there were probably something superficial about the wrong sort of guy that made it easy for you or whatever it was. It might be, it's brave to stop drinking too much. It's brave to stop eating too much or too little. Yeah. It's how we end the book actually about, um, we just need to be brave. And I am forever in bewildered awe of the bravery of the people that I've worked with over the years that despite that shame that they may feel or the the reluctance they have to address some of these things that they show up and they do the work and it takes so much courage to do that and I've seen people do things that even I I, even with years of working on myself and being clinical practice I would struggle to do um such like courageous behavior um just being willing to show up and be vulnerable takes such courage um but it's amazing when we do and so, yeah, it is, it's just taking a bit of a leap and being brave. Yeah. 